Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear music from the stovepipes. But first, joining me now is Dr. Jo Joan Connell, who is the chair of the North Dakota Physician Advisory Committee and the field medical officer for the North Dakota Department of Health. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, I had to get it all out, uh, a lot of titles and everything, but as we get started, can you tell the folks maybe a little bit about your background and how you came into these roles? Um, well, I moved back to North Dakota after getting a pharmacy degree, a medical degree, and a master's in biomedical research uh, from the University of Colorado. And I got back home in 2002 and started uh, working as a pediatrician and worked uh, for UND for the med school teaching pediatrics until 2015 when Dr. Terry Dwelly, um, the state health officer at the time, invited me to come be the field medical officer for the North Dakota Department of Health. Um, so I've maintained my clinic, but transitioned from teaching to public health, got a master's in public health <laughs> in these last few years, um, and then uh, when coronavirus was, it was known it was going to become a pandemic, uh, my Lynn Tufty, our current state health officer, and Tim Weedrick, head of emergency response, um, asked if I would put together a group of physicians who could uh, provide advice when requested uh, regarding the pandemic. And, and that's how we came to be. Okay. Well, with that, with that said, and you're kind of describing it, but, but what has been your role, of course, with the, the, the pandemic of coronavirus? Uh, well, so as leader of the physician advisory group, um, we uh, get topics uh, from which uh, joint command would like uh, advice, um, medical advice, and then we discuss those as a group and provide recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, so that has taken up a big part of my time. I also uh, feel the health facility complaints um, that are turned into via the COVID hotline. Um, and that has really been a nice opportunity to get to know lots of um, very uh, wonderful administrators and chief medical officers from around the state. Um, and work with everybody on developing best practices in response to COVID-19. Um, additionally, from the physician advisory group, we've had uh, interest in getting surgeons and anesthesiologists and OR nurses together uh, to talk about some of the surgical needs in North Dakota and how um, to best provide them during this pandemic. And so we had our first meeting of surgical leads last week, and, and that has been a very passionate wonderful group of, of um, healthcare providers advocating, advocating for North Dakota citizens. So that's been an amazing experience too. Mm -hmm. Well, have you been providing uh, sort of <clears throat> input to directly with the governor? And if so, uh, what kind of input have you been providing? Well, we are a group that was formed through the North Dakota Department of Health. So our advice, um, is based on needs of the Department of Health leadership, including Mylan Tufty, Kirby Kruger, and uh, Tim Weedrick. Yeah, well then can you talk about what you've been seeing, I guess, you know, especially since the state has starting to, started to reopen. And so, uh, you know, what, what uh, you know, cases of course are going up, but there's more testing, so can you comment on that? Right. Um, well, so our group has been participating in modifying policies. Um, for example, we uh, just looked at uh, the guidelines for testing policy that I think is going to be released today and provided recommendations on that, which includes a section about antibody testing, which I know many people are interested in. Um, we also recently had an impromptu meeting um, when we learned we were going to get remdesivir, uh, the antiviral agent that's being studied um, in uh, COVID. And uh, we developed recommendations regarding who um, would be the best 
candidates to receive that medication. Yeah, are, yeah. Are you seeing uh, with the reopening and things? Are you are you hopeful that we'll get back to? Of course, it's going to be a new normal regardless. I think, but uh, you know, this summer is it going to be fall, or uh, is is a peak still coming? Uh, Ken, how much can you comment on that? Um, well, I think uh, we have learned an incredible lot about uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the last six and a half months. Um, and I think we're going to continue to learn more about this virus and the answers will play out, so to speak. Uh, in my, and that is my professional opinion. In my personal opinion, um, I like to think of this as of mile two in a marathon. Um, this is the point where everybody's getting a little frustrated. Um, maybe you started out a little fast and you're getting a little tired and just want it to be over with. Um, so we are having this opportunity now to, to relax a little bit, um, be outside more and get, a, get another breath um, in preparation for uh, an upsurge in the fall and winter. It's my hope that we'll continue to build capacity for testing. Um, so as the governor has outlined several times in his press conferences, um, we'll be able to detect, isolate, quarantine, um, and really minimize those exposures. Well, can, can you uh, talk a little bit about nursing homes and maybe assisted living places? I mean, nursing homes uh, sometimes seem to have been hit maybe the hardest. Right. Well, that's very true. And we know um, that the more um, comorbidities or additional chronic diseases that one has, the more vulnerable they are to the worst effects of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and age seems to be one of those comorbidities. Uh, so when you have people living closely together, interacting closely, um, in a congregate setting like a, a nursing home and the average age of that population is over 65, um, it, it is of course at risk. Um, but I think that there's been a lot of great work around testing um, that's been done. And of course around um, stopping the spread and kind of protecting that population. Um, so the next step is going to be uh, figuring out that sweet spot. How can we um, ha give these uh, residents some um, interaction with their loved ones uh, while minimizing risk? And, and that's, gonna, that's going to be um, a sweet spot. Well, I understand you have an elderly mother in a nursing home, so you have some personal experience. Uh, how are you and your mother coping with this? Yeah, well, so um, it's extremely tough. I'm one of these people who go to visit my mom all the time, <laughs> several times each week in the nursing home. And, and I've enjoyed that. And it's been a big part of both of our lives since she was admitted in 2011. Uh, so this is hard. Uh, our nursing home has been exceptional at uh, number one, uh, being really committed to providing safe patient care. And I think that the staff makes a lot of personal sacrifices to minimize risk to their patients. Um, and I am so very appreciative to all of those on the true front lines. Um, our, the staff also does a great job of uh, arranging video chats, which is what I'll be doing <laughs> right when we end this phone call. Uh, we have those three to four times a week, um, and all of my sisters and I participate uh, with my mom. Um, and then most of the other evenings, I will call my mom um, and just call the nurse, the nurse's station, and they'll take a phone down to my mom, <laughs> and so I can visit with her for a few minutes. Uh, so this is this is challenging, and it's certainly I'm a pretty touchy person. So and so is my mom. So it's not our ideal. Um, but my mom, who is a nurse, um, says if I get this, I will die. Uh, so she understands the risks, um, and and we found this balance that I think is tolerable. Yeah. With that said, though, and maybe maybe that's going to be your response. You know, what is your advice to people? that have loved ones in nursing homes? 
Um, well, I would encourage them to explore all the options for um, virtual engagement and take advantage of those as frequently as possible. And what I've noticed with my mom is um, when I would come, I would commit to staying for at least an hour. And sometimes that would get a little um, long. <laughs> so now our video chats are 45 minutes. Um, and when I call, it's usually 15 to 20 minutes, but I can, I can commit to that each day, even with as busy as things have been um, since the pandemic. Uh, I've asked people about a crystal ball, and I tell you what, crystal balls seem pretty dark right now to, to read them. When do you anticipate people will be able to go visit in person to nursing homes and places like this? Well, that's a great question because CMS just released um, recommendations to figure out how to make that possible um, within the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I think that you may have heard uh, the governor and Chris Jones talking about how they're going to analyze that. And if you look in those CMS recommendations, <clears throat> it's similar to opening up other things. You have to look at um, what are the disease rates in your community, where are you at with testing, um, and your capacity for testing. Um, and I think North Dakota seems to be on many good uh, tracks for that. Um, the CMS is recommending weekly surveillance testing in the nursing homes, um, and then it does give a give some leeway uh, for individual communities and states to, to fudge that a little bit, I think. Um, and so I, I do think we're on our way uh, to, to achieving those criteria. And when that happens, it doesn't mean there will be no coronavirus, uh, but it means if you're regularly surveying, you're picking up that asymptomatic population within a few days, you can isolate them, you can quarantine all of their contacts and you can minimize uh, the spread of the disease. So you don't end up having a situation like happened in Washington state. Well, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how the virus uh, is spread? I mean you know, is it through contact? Is it uh, through uh, picking it all off of surfaces? So how does it spread? So we know that it survives on surfaces um, for up to two or three days, depending upon the surface. We know it survives in the air for two to three hours. Uh, and when we talk about what are our, the things we know work to slow down the spread of the virus, uh, social distancing, and that helps with airborne spread, and then uh, great hand and face hygiene. Wash your hands, don't touch your face. That helps with contact spread. Um, currently, it, and we went um, really aggressive on all of those measures initially, um, and I think we've done a great job at slowing down the spread of the virus. Um, now, as we learn more about the virus, it seems like the, the majority of the spread is seeming to come through droplet um, spread via the air. Mm -hmm. well, but you know, outside of Cass County, it seems like the state of North Dakota has somewhat contained or uh, controlled it maybe. Is that a fair statement? Well, certainly we have counties that report no cases. Um, and Cass County obviously reports the majority of cases. Um, but I think uh, I have illustrated this to some of my family members is if you ever um, used to play with watercolors and you would take a bunch of different um, paintbrushes, each with a different color and you drop a drop of watercolor onto a, onto a piece of paper and when you start with four to five drops, you know, there's no way those things are gonna touch and coalesce. Um, but the more drops that you drop on, eventually they start coalescing or bleeding into each other. And then that becomes um, diffuse, wet paper um, instead of art. And so that's in my mind, simplistically, that's how I see virus spread. Um, North Dakota and other rural states are lucky because we are distantly located from each other. 
Um, and so far, people have been really great about personal responsibility, um, uh, uh, involved in great hand hygiene, face hygiene, and social distancing. Um, once that gets a little carried away, then you start getting that coalescing. So, so the, the route to success of this, unless we or until we get a great vaccine and good uh, treatments, uh, is to continue to keep those droplets isolated from each other and few in number. You know, so so if, if stay at home or shelter in place orders uh, made a significant impact, you know, there are there are those that out there that think uh, we should not have done some of that. Yeah, and I think um, I, I I think it's always great to be in the position of playing. Um, quarterback after the game is over. <laughs> um, but I think there are many instances where you can look at um, communities, countries, states um, that were not able to be as effective in their um, regulations that promoted social distancing uh, and have not had the wonderful outcomes that we have had so far. And in spite of that, you know, wonderful outcomes there. It, it's important for everyone to be, remember and be sensitive to the fact that we have had deaths in North Dakota. Um, and, you know, as a physician, uh, I would like no more deaths. <laughs> I, would, I would like to be aggressive about this um, so, until we have treatments and vaccines available. Well, speaking of that, uh, just go right to that. So what is your best guess on what your, the data you have and what the research is being done and when a vaccine would be available and, and workable? Yeah, um, I think that it would, in general, it takes a minimum of 12 to 18 months to introduce a vaccine. And that is if everything works perfectly. Um, and that is the way the FDA has set this up to make sure that vaccines that are administered are safe. Uh, so we don't want to rush this process because we don't want uh, mass administration of an unsafe medication or vaccine. Um, yet we do hope that everything would work smoothly <laughs> with some of these vaccine candidates um, so that we'll have safe, effective products available um, hopefully by next winter, spring. Okay, well, I wish we had more time, but if people do wanna get more information, where can they go, who can they contact? So contacting um, the North Dakota Department of Health at the coronavirus website, um, ndresponse.gov is also a great place to look for information. And if you search CDC, uh, coronavirus, and any topic of interest you have, uh, you'll find great information there as well. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Stay safe, everybody. Stay tuned for more. The Stovepipes are a group of four powerhouse musicians who hail from the Highway 10 region of Minnesota. Their own stage energy results in true entertainment. to be someone else have you been down that line you got me soaking wet another pool stuck in the rain with your dancing shoes till I'm black and blue you do a number on my brain Have you seen it? Have you seen the sign? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? 
working mind Would you take me home to keep Have you been to the medicine man?
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. Please be safe, and as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.